click if you want. And then what is share screen? Hello? I want you to talk and join or do share the screen. Um, oh, Google, Microsoft. Okay. All right. Hello? Meeting IP address. meeting. Hello, Zame? Yeah, switch on your camera. Uh, my camera is on. Uh, no, no, at the moment. Start with you. Yeah, oh, right. look at the, the thing down. Okay, and I've got you, yeah? My camera is not on. Look, look at the look base at the uh, on the on left the hand corner. corner. Uh, there is start, start video or stop video. What we did just a few minutes ago. Uh, start video, okay. All right, yeah, okay. Not, yeah, yeah, now, now you're yeah. live. Okay. Now you're live. We've got about three minutes to go, so hopefully right. that should be enough time. Shall I share my screen with you or not yet? Uh, not as yet. Let me start by introducing you. So I will do a couple of slides uh, on presenting you, and then we will share. Uh... Is that okay? That's fine. So I, uh... And then when I tell you to, because I start recording, so before I record, I will actually share my screen first, and then I'll ask you to share your screen. Okay. So, so this is what you're seeing at the moment now. Can you see? Enter this here, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so give me a couple of slides. I'll just introduce you and then we'll have everybody else on. Okay. So I'm just waiting for five o'clock and then I'll log on. But two more minutes. Uh, everybody else, can you hear us? Uh, can Nikhil, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, we can hear. Good, good. And, and can, can you see, and see the slides also. You can see the slides. Okay, so we'll just get, uh, we'll just introduce Mr. Amar and then we'll get on with the. We're already live on YouTube. So if anybody's finding difficulty logging on to this group, you can log on to YouTube. At the moment, uh, we've still got more places, uh, so we haven't had a full house just as yet. But people will log on. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of Torah Gurus. Uh, today, uh, we are privileged and honored to have uh, with us uh, uh, Mr. Khaled Amer. Uh, in the UK, if you're an FRCS, you're called as Mr. 
so you work all your life to become a doctor and then you pass your FRCS exam and then you become a mister. So I personally address uh, uh, him as Mr. Kaladamer. So it, it's really an honor and a privilege to, uh, uh, to welcome Mr. Amer to our forum today. Uh, I, I just want to share a few things with you before I invite Mr. Amer to give his talk. The reality is that, uh, you know, whatever we are today, whatever I am today, uh, we are who we are because we are standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, before us who have actually set the standards, who have uh, really created values, and, and we are able to become who we are purely because of the hard work done by the generation before us. And really, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. Kale Demer. Mr. Kale Demer uh, is one of the earliest adapters of the VATS technology uh, in, the, in the UK. Uh, so Mr. Demer is the, one of the earliest adapters of VATS technology in the UK. He, uh, he's, he, he is a very, guy, he's a keen guy who always wants to push the boundaries. And when something new comes along, a new technology comes along, he is very, very sensitive to change and very quickly uh, picks up uh, a new technology and puts it to maximum benefit uh, of the patients. And, and so really that is the one thing that we learned from him very early. And, and if you see his uh, videos, on lymph node dissection by VATS, it's probably one of the best techniques you can ever come across in the world. I, I have had the fortune of holding the camera for him and being with him when he was designing his techniques. And I promise you his videos are second to none uh, in terms of advanced lymph node dissection. And particularly, he excels in the understanding of the mediastinal anatomy. Uh, uh, particularly looking at recurrent laryngeal nerve anatomy. And I, I know I, I have actually been with him when uh, we have been in, a, in cadavers, uh, you know, trying to dissect into the iota pulmonary window and trying to understand where exactly the recurrent laryngeal nerve comes and where it goes. And, and today I'm hoping that he gives us some insight into that. And I'll tell you, once you listen to his understanding of recurrent laryngeal nerve anatomy, it will never be the same for you. You will go back and completely look at the iota pulmonary window in, in a totally different way. Uh, he, he is a geek. I, I call him a geek. Uh, you know, as, uh, very many years junior to him. But I, I, do, I do think that he's a geek. He's a computer expert. He, he's just a wizard when it comes to working on the computer. And I know for a fact that he has written his whole database for lung cancer surgery by coding the software. So he knows how to code and he knows how to break, uh, you know, any issues come up with the, with the database, he will get into the code of the yeah, database and solve the problem. Uh, and not only that, he is an expert video editor and, and you have to see some of his videos, not just medical, but some non-medical videos to understand the quality of the editing that he does is, is I think Hollywood standard to be really honest, it's that good. Uh, not only that, he's an excellent tennis player. Uh, he, he, he excels in sports. Uh, he has played in, at Julius level. He is representing his country at the Wimbledon Grand Slam. So this is no, no small feat. And I promise you, even today, no youngster can beat him in tennis on the tennis court. Uh, and I know that he goes at least twice a week, if possible, uh, to go and play tennis. Uh, he doesn't like to admit this, but he's actually a very good guitar player. He's very shy about this, but uh, I have heard him play the guitar and he is just a wonderful guitar player, an excellent musician. And he's got great ability in his hands. He loves to do wood carving, uh, particularly he takes matchsticks. And I think I've seen a huge uh, model of, of a ship created out of simple matchsticks. And, and this is a really intricate work. It's not something just put together haphazardly very beautifully done. So it is, it is on the mantelpiece in his uh, drawing room. I am very proud to say that he is my mentor. Uh, I, I really, I started working with him way back. And when he started the VATS program, I was one of the early senior registrars who came in with him. And I spent thousands of hours holding his camera and learning uh, his thought process more than anything else. 
And that actually helped me to understand how to perform VATS from him. And all my techniques, everything that I know today is because of uh, him. He has taught me uh, everything from the word go. So I am really, really, I, he was responsible for me. I was a cardiac uh, person mentally, and he was responsible for changing my thought process from cardiac to thoracic surgery. So I was this little kid. Uh, if you see this little fellow in the corner, and he took me under his wings. Uh, he, he saw something in me. I, I had no idea that I had some talent. He saw something in me, but he put me through the rigors. He, he gave me a tough time during the training years. He put me into the high heat furnace, put me in high pressure situations, you know, beat me, cut me, polish me. And eventually he made something like this out of, the, out of my career. But even at that stage, I didn't know that I was this or I had a potential to become this. So he took me to the top of the cliff and then pushed me off the cliff and said, learn to fly. He, he literally told me, go out there in the world, learn to fly and, and make a difference in people's lives. So, you know, when, when I went out there, you know, I stumbled, I fumbled. It was not an easy journey. I was so used to having, being under his wings. Uh, but being alone out there in the big wide world, you know, it was difficult. So I tumbled, grumbled, did everything possible, failed enough times. But every time he said, if you fail, you have to fail forward. That is the reality. And that's the reason why I learned to be a thoracic surgeon. So all my abilities in thoracic surgery are thanks to Mr. Ema. He is the true thoracic guru. He is very unassuming, very quiet. He doesn't, you know, uh, talk much unless I <laughs> talk to him, but he is. He's the true thoracic guru. He's the true guru in every sense of the word. So thank you, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you for, uh, you know, everything that you've done for me. And thank you for teaching me the meaning of life and, and taking me to a place where I can now impact other people's lives. Uh, the floor is all yours, Mr. Take it, Mr. Ahmad, take it away. I will want you to share your screen. I'll stop my share. And if you share your screen, we will then uh, continue with the presentation. Right. Um, share screen and then how about yeah, that can you see that mystery. yeah absolutely mr Emma. and can you hear me well beautifully okay well thank you very much for this introduction i have never imagined that i was any of it all but uh, having lived this far i suspect um, i had time to do all these things together but the most important thing uh, with regard to discovering jewels you learn over the years when you meet people who's good, who's bad, who's ugly. And uh, you're right. I saw something in you the first time I saw you. The first Friday when we were on call and you were the new registrar and you told me to come over the weekend. Nobody tells me to come over the weekend to see a patient. And you called me to come and you insisted. They said, you have to come now. I liked it then. And I knew that I had a very good registrar. And you, you proved it over the years. Um, and I can see from the word go that you think out, outside the box. You're not just an ordinary person. Um, to help such a character, you need to be humbled enough. No matter how high you are, you need to understand the potential. And you need to see how far someone can go. And then you need to help them. And I always tell you this, Zameh, that you owe it to someone you don't know. You owe it to someone whom you don't know yet. Maybe you haven't met yet that mm -hmm. you need to train mm -hmm. uh, in the future. And the same happened to me. And the cycle must go on. You will have to train someone you don't know and he will have to probably, or she will have to train someone they don't know. And the cycle okay. goes on. The most important thing about knowledge is not only to look for the truth, but also to deliver your knowledge to someone else who might see it in a different way or in a better way. Sure. This is very important. Anyway, um, a lot being said, um, the aim of this presentation is to give you some facts about N2 disease in non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I must warn you, N2, disease is a little bit complex and this presentation yeah 
bear with me and uh, you can also uh, i don't know whether this can be interactive or not but you can always stop me if if there is something that you really need to understand i'm sure I zamir we'll will do yeah we'll interact at the end of your talk mr ema so that Fantastic. everybody will uh, have a chance okay. to talk. Uh, but basically i'm preparing you for a very heavy uh, talk sure um, um how do we define n2 disease n stands for nodes as you know and it's part of the tnm uh, system t stands for tumor n for node uh, m for metastasis so nodes that are being considered as uh, n2 uh, have got single digits i e 8 9 7 2 rs 3 a and 3 p and i hope you understand what we mean by these um uh, nomenclatures And on the left side, eight L, nine, seven, five, six, four L, and two L. Great. Uh, we possibly can give uh, a separate talk about these uh, nodes and where they are, and show you some videos because it might be sometimes hard to imagine where they are. So these are the N2 nodes. What's the incidence of N2 node disease in non-small cell lung cancer? It can be as high as 45%, so it's quite prevalent. Where do these hide? This is a video, but I'm not going to show it. I will leave this to another talk, should the need arise. The first thing I would like to see, as I said earlier on, N2 disease is quite a heterogeneous disease. It is really, really heterogeneous. There is not one single group that we can, we can say this is N2 disease. If you look at the size of the tumor, joint with any N2 uh, involvement of nodes, you will, you will find that there are two groups which have got two different uh, prognosis. The, uh, size of the tumor which forms uh, t1 to 3 in other, in other words anything which is uh, possibly less than 7 cm tumors if they've got n2 disease they have a separate prognosis from t4 n2 disease which takes your staging into a 3b the first category the t1 to 3 when they have n2 nodes we call them 3a n2 because 3a also is heterogeneous uh, and they can be attributed to other um, um, pathologies such as uh, invasive central tumors they can be 3a and here you will find that the um, the um, prognosis is is much better than those extensive huge 7 cm tumors which have got n2 disease The general rule or the general advice is for the large ones do not operate because the five year survival is in the region of 5%. It's not worth it. Send them to chemo radiotherapy from the word go. <coughs> Based on the number of 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 nodes, we've got something called single zonal and multi zonal disease. Okay? So the single zonal which is P stands for pathology, so uh, PN2A, again, has got a different prognosis from multi-zonal N2 disease. 35, uh, 34% five-year survival uh, for the single zonal, and the five-year survival for the multi-zonal is only 20%. Now, you might be confused about what is a zonal. I'll just read something for you here. A nodal zone is an anatomical area that includes one or several neighboring N2 nodes. Nodal zones help to locate nodal involvement without having to define the exact anatomical location of the nodes. 
the supraclavicular, for instance, is a station one. And the subcarinal zone is a, is a, is a station seven. <coughs> These are zones, but I've got only a single node. Whereas there, whereas there are other nodal zones, which include two, three, or more, more that, than three nodal stations. For example, take the right paratracheal area. The right paratracheal area is a single zone, but it contains a station two and four R. So it's important to realize in theory, a single zone may have more or multiple nodes involved in one or more nodal stations. This is very confusing, I know. The nodes might be small or large, it doesn't matter. The concept of nodal zones is a special one and it's of a special value to the patients who are going for chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy people, they don't want to know exactly where is, you know, a station seven or a station eight. Or they, they speak of zones because they want to coll collate or collimate their treatment into that region. It's important for them to know where they are going to uh, collimate the radiotherapy, for instance, into the, that zone. So the precise anatomical location of the node is not important for them. Just to give you a background about nodal, uh, single zone and multi-zone. Now, again, based on the site of the node, we find that N2s have got different prognosis, for instance. If you have a central node like station seven, the prognosis is very bad. Anything central in the body, any central cancer, central cancerous lymph node is bad. Station seven has got a worse five-year uh, survival than anything else. Two to four R and five and six on the left-hand side, I've got a 35% five years survival, whereas a single node in station seven central, I've got a 22% uh, percent five year survival. Where's there anything else? So we are speaking about heterogeneous disease. It is never the same. And again, we have this difference in N2 disease, an N2 disease which you catch up when you are working your patient up for surgery. In other words, clinical staging, such as uh, when you do a CT scan or when you do a PET scan, or even further, when you are working your patient by say mediastinoscopy or EBUS. In contradistinction to the post-operative N2 nodes, i.e. the ones that you find during the operation or uh, when you do a systematic node dissection and you are sort of uh, faced with uh, unexpected N2 disease. Now, believe it or not, the prognosis is different. Now, the uh, thoracotomy N2 disease, I've got a 24% five year survival, whereas um, the The, uh, the N2 disease that we depict from the clinical um, workup, such as um, the astronoscopy and EBUS, has got a worse five year survival. It makes you wonder, um, how can I use this information? I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the point I want to drill in is that it is not that you're not dealing with the same disease. It's quite heterogeneous. The behavior is completely different and the prognosis is different. Now, let me take you further to the dilemma. So the chest physician will tell you at this stage, okay, Mr. Raymer, are you going to operate on my patients or not? I'm not really interested. Just tell me, are you going to operate or not? So. You as a clinician, you start, you know, mumbling, mm, I don't know mm, the evidence. Whatever you say, you must back your decision with an evidence. And in a nutshell, what I can tell you is that surgery 
can only be selective. In other words, you choose the patients with N2 disease in whom you are going to operate. And even when you do that, you'll have to explain to them why you're operating, what's your evidence, and whether you are going to follow that by an adjuvant chemotherapy or an adjuvant radiotherapy, and your evidence for that. And the reason for that is the following. We at the center of treating cancer patients, we are at the cancer network. So can you see my um, mouse? Yes, yes, we can. We are somewhere here. Uh, the surgeon, uh, the radiotherapist, and the chemotherapist, we deliver the treatment for the patients. And we are guided by our cancer networks. These collate information for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the British Thoracic uh, Society, the European Society, and the American Society for uh, Lung Cancer. And these bodies all around the world gain their information from research. So the most single important thing is research. It is going to tell us what to do now and in the future. And everything that you are going to do is based on that. So research, research, research is very, very important. So let's come to this. Uh, the effectiveness of surgery with or without multimodal treatment in N2 disease. The National Institutes tell us that in non-bulky single zonal N2 disease, one should consider trial of surgery with or without other things such as post-operative adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy. But you must register your outcomes and they must be and this must include the mortality uh, in five years. So you offer them surgery, you follow that by uh, multimodality treatment, but you keep your records and you analyze your five year survival rate. As a result, a number of randomized controlled trials have already taken place. This is not new. So people have done surgery in this group and they followed that by adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy and they analyzed their data. Um, and they have concluded that the most important thing is that when you add surgery to whatever you're doing, you don't harm your patients. So surgery, if, if you say I'm going to operate and then also give them say chemotherapy later on, you're not harming them. You're not really reducing their survival chances. That's a very good plus thing. And I personally believe in, in, in this sort of um, axiom that if you do surgery to these N2 disease patients, you are not really harming them and you are not really um, curtailing their uh, survival um, possibilities. <clears throat> Nonetheless, all these randomized controlled trials that went on to look into surgery and other modalities, they didn't look into the subgroups. So we, we are in a sort of an uncharted sea. We don't know really where we can recommend surgery in patients and follow that say by chemoradiotherapy because most of these studies have included everything together, including bulky multizonal disease and things that should not have had surgery at all. As I said earlier on, um, when it is T4, say for instance, T4 and 2 um, they did not differentiate between what is possible and what is not possible. So this is an area where research will tell us in the future what to do. Um, this is the definition of bulky. When you say N2 bulky nodes, what does it mean? Um, in essence, the uh, European society defined it as nodes which are larger than 23 um, and possibly you won't be able to see or define the outskirts of the mass. So they are sort of matted together lymph nodes, uh, more than 25 uh, millimeters. They will call it bulky. Um, now we come to the, say the guidelines um, from the BTS, uh, from the society, um, and from other sources, they are almost the same. 
the British Thoracic Society tell us that we should consider radical radiotherapy or chemotherapy when we have bulky fixed N2 disease, T1, T4, N2 bulky or fixed, obviously without metastasis. But it also leaves the door open and it says consider surgery as a part of multi-modality management in patients who have got a smaller tumor such as T1 to T3, non-fixed, non-bulky, all these things are hazy, uh, nebulous, non-fixed, non-bulky, single zone. How could you know that it is non-bulky, non-fixed from a CT scan, for instance? <clears throat> Um, and it concludes that further randomized control trials are needed in, uh, in this uh, sort of uh, area of, of, of um, treating non-small cell lung cancer. Now, uh, the European guidelines say the same, uh, but it identifies the heterogeneity um, of the nodal involvement uh, and it says that this data cannot be invoked to, pr to propose uh, upfront surgical treatment. In other words, all the data that we have, all the research, all the uh, randomized controlled trials cannot be concluded to tell you that you can operate in, in all N2 disease and then follow that say by adjuvant chemotherapy. It is totally heterogeneous disease and you have to be selective. Uh, and it also says that there is a room for well-designed prospective study to evaluate the possible uh, role of primary surgery in preoperative proven single zonal or single station N2 disease. Europe, and indeed the UK is divided into two sort of, um, of camps. One camp would operate on all uh, N2s that are removable by surgery. In other words, if you can operate on the tumor, the tumor is operable and you've got N2 nodes, say a single zonal N2 nodes that can be resected by systematic nodal dissection during the surgery, then you should take that patient for upfront surgery, follow that by chemo radiotherapy. This is my practice. And I believe in it, and I will probably tell you the evidence later on, and I hope it's included in this uh, presentation. Um, right, I'm going to miss this one, this version. Right, the, there is evidence uh, from uh, the uh, the C0030 trials uh, and from the Blaine um, trials that has shown that there isn't much of a difference in terms of five-year survival uh, between N2 disease uh, when it's treated by chemo radiotherapy upfront and if it is treated by surgery upfront. In actual fact, if the surgery includes pneumonectomy, especially right pneumonectomy, then the prognosis is worse. And that specific study, Albain, the Albain study has um, told us that the best treatment for these patients is to take them up front for curative chemoradiotherapy. So the question of um, if, you, if you are faced with a patient who has got an N2 disease, can we downstage that uh, by giving them ad, new adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy and then take them for surgery later on? So this is one solution or Shall we take them up front for a radical chemo radiotherapy and no surgery? The evidence is for the radical chemotherapy and no surgery. However, there are some um, 
trials which have shown the efficacy of this downstaging. The problem with downstaging is if you want to stick to it, then you will have to restage. And restaging means you have to do for the second time a mediastinoscopy or a second time EBUS. And this is heavily contested. So the evidence here is difficult to get. Um, there is one principle that nobody will contest. Everyone agrees on it. Is that when you've got no enlarged lymph nodes on the CT scan and there is completely innocent PET, i.e. there are no mediastinal lymph nodes lighting up on the PET, these patients, no one will dispute their, their path their pathway. They should go direct up front to surgery. And the surgery must include routine systematic nodal dissection. Even if you didn't have any evidence on the PET for the nodes, they must have routine systematic nodal dissection. And the reason for that is 15% of them will have undeclared, hitherto undeclared, or unexpected N2 disease, 15%. That's a large number. It should be an indication for you to do routine systematic node dissection in all your patients. If you are not doing that, I'll come later on, I hope in this presentation, um, and I'll tell you what you are actually doing if you don't believe in systematic node dissection. However, in central tumors of N1 or N2 nodes, Preoperative mediastinal staging is indicated regardless of operability. This is what the European uh, society is telling us. I personally disagree with them. The reason for that is whatever you are going to do with your N1 or N2 nodes, whatever you want to know about them, whether they're involved or not, this will have to be tied to what you want to do. In other words, let me give you this scenario. You've got someone with, uh, say, a, a central uh, with a tumor that has got an N2 on the PET. If you discuss such a patient in an MDT meeting, um, the oncologist will jump to the conclusion and they will tell you that they need an EBUS to document whether the nodes have got malignancy on them or not, which is fine. And the reason for that is they, may, they might go back and tell you that this patient has got N2 disease, one of, of the ones that has been discovered by the clinical workup. And your choices are one of two. Either you take him up upfront to surgery and then bring him back again for adjuvant chemotherapy or downstage by new adjuvant chemotherapy and then operate later on or take him upright for curative radical chemotherapy and no surgery. These are your choices. Again, for each way you go, whether <coughs> ultimate chemoradiotherapy only or new adjuvant downstaging chemotherapy followed by surgery, or upfront surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, you must have evidence. And the evidence must be based on the randomized control trials level 1A and so on. We know all this. If you believe that there is no difference in uh, N2 disease between those who will have the, ad, the new adjuvant chemotherapy and those who will have adjuvant chemotherapy, in other words, uh, is there a difference between delivering the chemotherapy before surgery compared to after surgery, if the tumor is operable? The answer is no. There is no evidence that there is a difference, okay? So if there is no difference, between delivering the chemotherapy before your operation or after the operation, why are you bothered? Why are we bothered to go after every single lymph node before the op 
operation by doing the astenoscopies, he busts and God knows what. If on the CT scan and the PET scan, we decide that this tumor is operable and the N2, there is only a single node, say in station seven, and we as surgeons are quite confident we will take it all. We will leave not a single lymph node there. Why bother? Why go for chemotherapy before the operation? You should take this patient up front for surgery, follow it by N2, by adjuvant chemotherapy. That's my, um, that's my, um, my practice. And I back it by results of um, randomized control trials. <coughs> and this is a very important <coughs> Publication by Eric Lim, and five of the uh, of the authors actually have uh, contributed to the European Society. So, in other words, they are coming a little bit back from their stern stance uh, on the first publication of the European uh, Society of Thoracic Surgery, telling us to go for e bus and to go for mediastinoscopy to try to prove that these nodes are involved or not involved. They tell us, uh, um, sorry, let me go back. They tell us upfront that if you can take the primary and if you can surgically remove all these N2 nodes and it is just one say, um, um, nodal group that's involved, not too many, then you should go up front to surgery. No need for EBUS, no need for mediastinoscopy. Just go there and do your, your systematic nodal dissection, or even better, a total adenectomy. Take everything and then analyze it, proper staging, and go for adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And this is the evidence. Eric Lim is very active in this, and he advocates that, and I I am following his uh, motto. And the reason for that uh, has been shown that the survival, when you use a bimodality, chemoradiotherapy, um, uh, and, and better is better when you use a surgery as one of these uh, bimodalities. Um, <clears throat> so they would ask us if you've got say N1 on the PET scan, uh, with a, a T up to three, you offer them surgery. N2, uh, T1 to three with an N2, uh, and you can remove it, you offer them surgery. There is evidence for that from the randomized control trials. So in conclusion, uh, this is not the conclusion of everything, but this is the conclusion so far uh, from uh, the American uh, and from the European uh, societies for treatment of lung cancer. Uh, there's no definite answer that could be provided regarding the optimal strategy for staging, restaging, and treatment of different subsets of 3A and 2 disease. Uh, there's something called the SPATU trial, um, which studies the resectable states 3 2 when you've got N2 disease. Um, uh, and selected stages, surgery in selected stages of 3B, non-small cell lung cancer. And there has been no significant difference between the control arm and the experimental arm. The control arm was an induction chemotherapy followed by definitive or radical chemoradiotherapy. So they received chemotherapy twice, a small dose as an induction dose, and they follow that by a radical chemoradiotherapy. That was the control arm. The experimental arm went for induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiotherapy, uh, followed by surgery. And there was absolutely no uh, difference in actual fact. There was a slight improvement in the arm that has got the surgery in it. I'm sure everyone is confused by now. <clears throat> if you're not confused, I'll be, I'll be surprised. And the reason for that is, in a nutshell, one word, this uh, heterogeneity of the disease, it is not the same. You are not usually comparing apples to apples or pears to pears. Therefore, you have to be selective in cutting out or carving a pathway for that particular patient 
and probably back it with some research if you can. Having said that, um, you must be very clear in your mind about the straightforward things. For instance, CT PET negative mediastinum upfront surgery. And you will have to do systematic nodal dissection. That is definitely for surgery. <clears throat> now, the controversial thing, you will have to have your own policy. But I, I suggest that this policy should not be Mr. Amer's policy. No, it is not. It is to be adopted by the MDT, the multidisciplinary team that will treat the patient. And the reason for that is you are not an island. You are not isolated from the treatment of the patient. You will have to have the agreement of the uh, radiotherapist and your oncologist and so on. They will have to agree with you that particular um, modality of treatment. So in N2 disease, with or without histological confirmation, you've got the three options, which we talked about. And that is the subgroup in which we should think, should we offer them surgery upright or not, followed by chemoradiotherapy or not? Should we downsize and then operate or not? Something like that. But you should also know your limit as a surgeon. In T4 and N2, bulky nodes, you should not operate. The prognosis is bad. So three, group, three groups. <clears throat> the one in which we know that definitely for surgery. And the one we, we know that definitely not for surgery. And in between, there is a rainbow. You decide which patient you are going to operate on and you carve a pathway and you will have to have the evidence for it. Now, management of unexpected N2 disease discovered at thoracotomy. This is an interesting one, and I will take it as an introduction to uh, Eric Lim's um, um, reporting um, about the randomized and non-randomized controlled trials uh, for chemotherapy before and after surgery. So, um, uh, Mark Ferguson, uh, in his publication, and that was in 2011, in a, a book uh, called The um, uh, Hard Decisions or Difficult Decisions about Thoracic Surgery, <clears throat> he says, when unsuspected N2 nodal disease is encountered during a planned lung resection, in other words, you are operating, you find N2 disease, you send it for frozen section, and the histopathology tells you that it is involved. What are you going to do? Are you going to complete the operation? or you're not going to complete the operation. Let us take these two scenarios. Someone will say, I'm, 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 I've opened the chest, I've done a thoracotomy. How come I just closed the thoracotomy and sent him for uh, chemotherapy? Mark Ferguson says that the evidence at that time, 2011, was to stop operating, close the chest, send him for uh, chemotherapy, and then bring him back again for a redo thoracotomy and remove the tumor <clears throat> and the lymph nodes. Two completely different uh, decisions, and each one has got terrible consequences. I don't believe in this. I don't believe that you should shut and close the thoracotomy and send the patient for chemotherapy, and the evidence is as follows. Preoperative versus this is a very important publication that you should know it inside out, back to front, through and through, <coughs> published by Eric Lim. Uh, the year was 2009. Probably Mark Ferguson should have known about it. Uh, but it, it concludes uh, that there is no statistical difference when you are treating patients who have preoperative or compared to postoperative delivery of the chemotherapy arm of the multidisciplinary treatment. In other words, whether you give your chemotherapy before the operation or after the operation, it does not change their prognosis. And if that is correct, then we go back to what I was saying earlier on. Why do we have to, to spend time and effort looking for 
every single lymph node in the mediastinum, whether it's involved or not, EBUS, mediastinoscopy, this and that. If it is surgically resectable, we should go and resect it. And if the systematic node that this section <clears throat> tell us that the mediastinum is involved, the patient goes for adjuvant chemotherapy. So what are the possibilities uh, or the protocols for treating N2 disease? And I have alluded to this previously. You've got three options. You do an, inject, an induction chemotherapy and you follow that by surgery, or you do a, a concurrent definitive radical chemoradiotherapy and no surgery. Or option three, upfront surgery, and you follow that by chemotherapy. You might add radiotherapy to it for local chest wall invasion or something like that. So <clears throat> induction followed by surgery. There is evidence. If you look into the literature, you will find a lot of it. But uh, the Albain um, uh, study, the randomized control study of 2009, which I alluded to earlier on, found that radiotherapy and chemotherapy upfront as a definitive radical treatment is as good as surgery. In actual fact, sometimes it is even better than surgery, especially if the proposed surgery. <laughs> Vijay, Dr. Vijay, your um, mic is on. <laughs> so if, if, <coughs> if, <coughs> If, uh, if the surgery entails uh, pneumonectomy, don't do it. Go for uh, radical chemoradiotherapy upfront and as a definitive treatment. I will reiterate on this again. The Albain study shows very clearly that if the surgery entails taking the whole lung out, especially on the right-hand side, which is a syndrome, don't do it. Don't do a right pneumonectomy after re, uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Just send them for definitive chemoradiotherapy, no surgery. Now, concurrently definitive uh, chemoradiotherapy, uh, chemo this is not our domain as surgeons, but uh, there is uh, so many studies which shows the efficacy of this. Uh, surgery followed by uh, Chemotherapy is what we do, is that this is our current practice based on the uh, evidence. Um, and as we said earlier on, all the randomized and the non-randomized control trials are based on the Eric Lim study, which we have alluded to earlier on, showed that there is no difference. And um, surgery followed by chemotherapy is as good as uh, downstage. Uh, this paper shows that here in the UK, we are not as good as other European countries. Um, this study, which was quite earlier on, uh, 2003, compares the United Kingdom to uh, Belgium, uh, Italy, and uh, Switzerland. And in the United Kingdom, we do not dissect nodes um, as uh, viciously as others in the European countries do. And we don't give this dissection, it's uh, due importance, I would say. Um, and hence was my personal uh, involvement with nodal dissection. The Japanese are light years ahead of us. They are really very good with this. And they lead the world, the work of uh, Tsugo Naruki um, as the first one who really made everyone aware that systematic node dissection is the key to uh, knowing the prognosis the single most important factor that will determine prognosis is the knowledge about the mediastinal nodal uh, status. And this fact was only uh, highlighted and materialized by Tsugu Naruki from Japan 15 years or 20 years ago. Uh, he was a phenomenal man. Um, anyway, so, we are in the UK, we're not as good as the rest of Europe. Um, um, and I would conclude the following, <clears throat> and this is my final conclusion. 
that N2 disease is heterogeneous. It's not the same. And you need to know um, the levels of heterogeneity. It's association with the size of the tumor, the number, where is N2, is it bulky, not bulky, and so on. There is the controversy about the, how to treat this subgroup will continue, it will never stop. But we need research. Um, in the MDT meeting, you should carve a unique pathway for each of your patients. And you must have some research to back it up. And you must audit your results. And that should include the five-year survival. So if you're doing something odd, I would argue to follow that by your studies and also publish your studies to the rest of the world so that we know. For instance, if someone um, tell me that uh, radiofrequency ablation uh, followed by surgery is the best thing ever for human beings, uh, next day I will do that to all my patients. Or, and I haven't read much about the, uh, say the possibility of immunotherapy. This is one area for you. If any one of you is enthusiastic, this is a very good subject which has not been studied yet. All our patients wait for something like between four to six weeks to have their operations. In these six weeks, these patients are sat up down doing nothing. You can introduce a, con a randomized controlled trials of two arms. One of the arms, you add immunotherapy. Uh, in these five, six weeks. And then you see following surgery, does that group fare better than the ones who do not have immunotherapy before their operation or not? Obviously there will be uh, some logistic things. In other words, if you are going to give them immunotherapy, then you must have histological diagnosis and you must have a bit of uh, cellular volume to um, uh, do, do the immunotherapy uh, testing. Uh, and that means you'll have to have uh, some surgery or bronchoscopy or something or EBUS uh, to get these cells. Uh, I was just, you know, sort of thinking in a loud voice. It, it would make a very good study, no doubt in my mind. Uh, bulky N2 disease is best treated by concurrent definitive radical uh, chemo radiotherapy. In other words, know your limits. There are bad tumors, very huge central uh, connected with bulky N2 disease, don't be a hero. There's, there is no need. You might be able to take it out. Yes, okay, fine. We don't operate because we can operate. We operate only if we know that the surgery will make a difference to the five-year survival rate. If it's not going to make a difference in the five-year survival rate, do not operate. Now, in the non-bulky, single zonal N2, I personally think that they should be treated by upfront surgery, but you must tell your patient that he will have to have chemotherapy. If they do not agree to the post-operative chemotherapy, I personally, I don't offer them surgery. Um, this statement, is uh, carved again from the uh, Eric Lim um, statement answering the European uh, um, thoracic surgical uh, guidelines. For operable uh, single zonal N2, you do not need EBUS to know whether these nodes are involved or not involved if you know that they are resectable by surgery. In other words, if you got a tumor and say a single zonal N2, say station seven, and you are quite confident you can take that by lobectomy and systematic node dissection, everything, including the PET nodes. If the MDT says that they want to send the patient for EBUS, you'll have to stand up and say, no, there's no need for EBUS. I don't need EBUS. I don't need mediastinoscope. I don't want to know whether they are histologically involved or not. I will do systematic node dissection upfront. And the reason for that is there is no difference in delivering the chemotherapy either before the operation or after the operation. So if you're telling me you want to downstage it by chemotherapy and then send him for surgery, I will send, tell you you're wasting time. Send him upfront for surgery and then he has to agree 
on chemotherapy after the operation six weeks down the line. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. It's just one of the most amazing talks I've heard. Uh, can I, before I go on to questions, can I ask you to show us a video of your mediastinal lymph node dissection, if you've got it on your desktop? I will try. Let me, give me a second. Yeah, okay, have a so... look and see. So wh while you're looking, I'll just address the audience. Uh, wh while Which you look one? For one? The left side or right side? Both, actually. We want to see both. It's, it's really important. And we also it will want take to 20 minutes to see them. That's Each one okay. is about 10, cent 10 minutes. Are you happy? I'm, to... sure, I'm sure it's okay with the audience. <coughs> um, in that case, left side it one. So wh while you're searching for the video, I just want to address the audience who is on the on the lecture. This is actually a very adult lecture. This is not for, you know, for for the weak hearted. This is not, you know, somebody who's who doesn't even know how to interpret a PET scan. This is a very adult lecture, very mature lecture. These are everyday situations that you will face in the multidisciplinary meeting when you have patients with lung cancer and a single zone N2 you should be able to justify the evidence that is available out there. I specifically asked Mr. Aymer to do this talk because this is such a controversial talk. At every meeting, we have fights over this talk. You know, every single meeting, people stand up and they put in, they, they vehemently oppose this discussion. And in the... Uh, fellowship exam for the European Thoracic Board, this discussion will come up. I promise you this. And in the FRCS exam for cardiothoracic surgery, if you're doing well and you've gone beyond the basic management, this discussion will come up. So this, the recording of this lecture is extremely important. You will not understand it all in one go because you're not dealing with these situations every day. I want you to go back when the recording gets uploaded and I want you to look at each of the study. I want you to write down the name of the study. And at the end, he's beautifully summarized all the various possibilities that are there. And I want you to write these possibilities down and write next to it, what is the level of evidence and which study are you referring to? I promise you that in the European board exam for thoracic surgery, this is the hot discussion topic. And if you don't know the studies which he spoke about, there is no way you can give an answer. This doesn't come out of guidelines. This is outside the guidelines. This is outside the box thinking. And you know the guidelines say N2 disease don't operate, just you know, uh, send it for chemotherapy. But this is different. This is, we're talking about chemotherapy before, we're talking about chemotherapy after surgery, or we are also talking about no chemo, no surgery, but chemo radiotherapy. So you should be able to defend these three discussions. Uh, so it is very important. This lecture is the most important. And when you go for another thoracic surgery meeting, you will find this. Uh, you will see somewhere in the room, the N2 discussion comes up and there is no right answer and we don't know the wrong answer. But you have to formulate your own answer. It's very, very, very important. It's a key discussion in thoracic surgery. Are you ready, Mr. Emma? Um, uh, I will be in, uh, give me some three minutes more um, okay. because I have to change the hard drives. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, as, as I told you in my last lecture, uh, I, I uh, you know, you must have more than one hard drives on your desktop. Everything should be, you know, uh, four terabyte and up. Now I've got four terabyte hard drives. Uh, you guys work with 64 GB, which is no good. <laughs> you really need, uh, you know, with all the videos that we are collecting over the years, Mr. Amer always travels with a camera uh, and, and he records everything, everything. You name it and he records it. And he's also always told me that the original recording is gold dust. You must never uh, use it. Remember in the video editing lecture, I told you never ever use the original recording. Always copy it and leave the original recording into another uh, file. You never know when you might need it. 
So yeah, that's that's the point. Uh, if anybody wants to ask any particular question now, feel free to ask. Uh, uh, write to me, and I I will I will uh, point it out. I have a few questions which I want to ask Mr. Ema, but I'll ask after he's finished the video because I want you to see. Uh, I can video. show you the, uh, the. We can start with the right side. It is narrated, Please, and I hope. Yeah. Um, and I hope if you if you can't hear, let me know so that I can. Uh, the what, one thing you'll have to do is you'll have to disconnect your headphone because the Bluetooth is taking away the sound into your headphone. So we will not hear if you don't disconnect your headphone. So just disconnect your headphone, get the native sound from the motherboard of your computer, and then we will hear it on your slide. Okay. Now, what should I do? Share my screen again. Share screen and then click start whatever is the video. Well, I lost you. No, 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 you are there. Just click on there. At the bottom, there's a green button called a share screen. Where are you? Oh, here you are. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, share screen. Yeah. And let's share this one. Sure. Great. Okay. Now um, you can tell me if if we just start yeah, just... at the University Hospital of Southampton, UK. We can hear very well. Thanks. We practice total genectomy, which means taking all existing nodes in all the stations. Our motto is: if you see a node, it should be in a pot. At the top of the screen, you should be able to see a table which gives important information about the nodal groups. It describes for each nodal station the average number and the range in brackets of nodes to be expected by the operator. The last column shows the percentage possibility of not finding nodes in that group. This information is based on a study done by Ziade et al. on postmortem humans in 2013. The location and anatomical boundaries of groups conform to the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer MAP 2009, IASLC in short. The bipolar device NCL is used routinely for nodal dissection. In the right chest, we start with releasing the inferior pulmonary ligament and halves the station nine nodes within the ligament and close to the inferior pulmonary vein. Nodes in station eight and nine could be discrete or could be harvested on block. They are completely absent in 40% of cases. Station eight nodes are found lateral to the esophagus from the level of the azygous arch down to the diaphragm. One should be careful not to cut the vagus nerve or dig holes in the esophagus. In addition, one should be mindful of structures which are not usually there, but could be there such as a hiatus hernia. These make the section of nodes difficult. Generally speaking, harvesting group eight and nine are straightforward. The average number of subcarinal station seven nodes is four, and they're always there. This is the only median station with no difference between right and left. Hence, it's important for contralateral spread of disease. Nodes are found between the two main right and left bronchi at the bifurcation of the main trachea and as low as the lower border of the bronchus intermedius. One should not worry about the thoracic duct as long as the esophagus is not mobilized. It is tucked out of harm's way between the esophagus and the vertebral bodies. The landmarks for station seven nodes are the azygous vein and the bronchus intermedius. The bed of the subcarinal space is made of pericardium, and this plane is relatively avascular, enabling start of dissection. These nodes get arterial supply from bronchial arteries directly from the aorta, and bleeding here can be notorious. The right vagus nerve is on the lateral wall of the esophagus, sending small twigs at the back of the hilum to the bronchi and nodal pack. All these vagal bronchial branches could be cut in the process of exposing the subcarinal space. Note that the paratracheal nodes around the bronchus intermedius should be considered as a station seven, 
the boundary is defined as the upper border of the lower lobe bronchus. However, some of these paterobronchial nodes are too low for station seven, and this has to be estimated. The left main bronchus should be well on display by the end of this dissection, and parabronchial nodes here are considered to be station 10L. The right paratracheal station 2 and 4 are, are usually 2 to 4 in number, but can rarely be absent in 2% of cases. There is no physical boundary between stations 2 and 4 and the fibrofatty noodle pack lies within the superior triangle. This triangle is bound by the phrenic and vagal nerves and the azygous arch. Note that station 3A and 3P are outside this triangle. Also note that the IASLC nodal map has shifted the median line to be on the left border of the trachea, meaning that pretracheal nodes are now labeled as 2 and 4R. The section is started by opening a trap door in the medial mediastinal pleura, covering the triangle. The vagus will be noted crossing from top to bottom of the main stem trachea, giving its large inferior cardiac branch in the middle of the triangle. Major start video. This branch could be cut with impunity. The lateral border of the pack is defined and the pack is gripped using a curved node forceps. One is to be aware of the existence of a constant vein on the medial border of the pack, draining the pack directly to the SVC. If cut inadvertently, the vein retracts behind the SVC and control of the breathing delays the procedure. From time to time, the right thoracic duct is seen as a large lymphatic channel on the medial border of the pack, between it and the superior vena cava, cursing up towards the apex of the triangle to join the jugular subclavian venous confluence posteriorly. This is the counterpart of the left thoracic duct and is not a constant feature. It is more translucent and lobulated than a nerve. In theory, injury of this large lymphatic channel could lead to postoperative chyle leak. Once the apex of the pack is freed and the base is separated from the aortic arch, the pack could be removed and blocked and further harm for hiding nodes is carried out. The of cured retrocable forearm node should be deliberately hunted. Note that the IASLC nodal map defines the lower border for station 4R as the lower border of the azygous arch. This makes all nodes below the azygous arch 10R. The nodal map also defines the border between 2 and 4R nodes to be the intersection of the distal margin of the innominate vein with the trachea. This is not readily identifiable unless you look behind the SVC. A better landmark is the origin of the brachycephalic artery from the arch of the aorta. The irony is, this landmark is only appreciated after the pack has been completely removed. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is found at the apex of the triangle. An easy way to find it is to follow the vagus above the azygous vein upwards until it meets the brachycephalic artery. The recurrent laryngeal nerve will be closely tucked around the brachycephalic artery, making a quick entry and exit into and out of the chest. The surgeon should avoid monopolar diathermy and ultrasonic energy devices around this area. 3A and 3P nodes are outside the superior triangle. Not routinely harvested, but it is worthwhile including them in the dissection. 
Three anodes are prevascular, anterior to the SVC, and between the phrenic nerve and the sternum. They are sometimes seen easily under the pleural investment. One should expect to see one to five nodes, and they are absent in more than half the times. Note the safety of the bipolar device within one to two millimeters from the phrenic nerve. Three P nodes are retrotracheal between trachea and esophagus. Between one to five nodes are expected to be found in this group. Again, this group is not harvested routinely, but a high uptake on the PET scan should mandate harvesting. These nodes lie within a mesh made by sensory branches of the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerves at the point of looping around the subclavian artery. Three P nodes are trapped within this mesh of nerves akin to trapped fish in a fisherman's net. It's very intriguing that the same arrangement exists on the left side. The surgeon should preserve and keep an eye on the motor branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but all other sensory tweaks can be safely sacrificed in the process of exposing the nodes. This concludes the description of the right-sided mediastinal nodal dissection. See you in the next chapter. This video clip describes the state of. So this was the right side. Uh, are you going to do the side. left side now? It's entirely up to you. No, please do it. We want it. Okay. Uh, let me fish it out. <clears throat> Right. Can you see that? No, the uh, side. Uh, no, your uh, one minute. Same as pause, pause. Your, you have to stop this one, which is uh, in the front. You have to stop your. I see. Your video is right in the front here. Yeah. The previous one. The previous one is still is showing actually. So stop oh, that, and then open the. You have got too many windows open on your desktop, so. Okay. So if I do this. Yeah, and now restart that window. Um, and show us the left side only. Just play it on your. The shed word, word is closed, it says. Can you see this one? I can see. You, you, you're not sharing, so you need to share the screen again. Oh, then I need to share. You stopped sharing, yeah. So. Okay. So just share screen again and then show us the left side. Share screen. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, it's come up now. That's good. Is it sharing now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. And harvesting station nine nodes. The average number of nodes is two and they can be absent in 23% of cases. These are found between the folds of the ligament and around the inferior pulmonary vein. Nodes can be discrete or can be dissected en bloc. Like the right side, dissection of these stations is straightforward. In addition, one should be mindful of structures which are not usually there, but could be there such as a hiatus hernia. A word of caution when harvesting station nine nodes is not to leave any of the nodes around the inferior vein, especially in the case of long lobectomy, as the surgeon might leave some of these nodes to go with the lobe specimen. It's important to harvest these nodes at this stage. If left to the histology lab to report it, the importance of the node as an N2 node might not be appreciated, and it might be reported as a Hyler Station 10 node, which is an N1 node. This will significantly downstage the disease. Again, Station 8 nodes are found in a parasophageal position and care must be taken not to injure the oesophagus or the vagus nerve.
the investing pleura over the oesophagus must be opened all the way down to the diaphragm to harvest the hiding stationate nodes. To harvest station seven on the left, good preparation is required. The number of nodes is usually four on average, exactly like the right side, and they are always there, never absent, and must always be consistently harvested. Circumcision of the hilum is helpful here. When the investing pleura over the back of the hilum is opened, the vagus nerve is identified, and all its bronchial branches are cut with impunity. There will be bronchial arteries arising directly from the aorta, and these must be controlled as well before exposing station seven nodes. The subcarinal space is exposed only after the bronchial vagal branches are disconnected. There will be nodes encountered at the back of the hilum in relation to the left main bronchus and the main pulmonary artery, bound inferiorly by the inferior pulmonary vein. These superficial nodes are station 10L and should not be confused with the subcarine and station 7 nodes. After harvesting all station 10 nodes, the main left bronchus is identified, membranous part facing the back of the hilum. Dissection follows the main bronchus proximally until the right main bronchus is identified at a level deeper than the esophagus. These deep nodes are harvested as a station seven. The latter lies in a third tier of depth deeper than the oesophagus, which is deeper than the descending aorta. Wow. By the end of the dissection, the right main bronchus should be clearly on display. Attention is then paid to harvest station five and station six L. Group five are subaortic in position. Group six L are preaortic in position. There's a similarity to group two and four R in so far as both are bound within a superior triangle. The left superior triangle is made up of phrenic, vagus, and main pulmonary artery. The medial mediastinal pleural draping is open between the two nerves, from base to apex. Care is taken not to injure the phrenic nerve, and it might be helpful to sling it out of harm's way. The superior intercostal vein drains the top three intercostal spaces and crosses the aorta from left to right to join the innominate vein and should be identified. Again, the <laughs> boundaries between station five and station six groups, and they are harvested on block. They get their blood supply directly from the arch of the aorta and receive sensory nerves directly from the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which are safe to cut close to the nodal pack. Group four and nodes require absolute mastery of the anatomy of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. They hide under the aortic arch in a left paratracheal position Top border is the upper limit of the aorta, and lower limit is the ligamentum arteriosum. For harvesting group 4L, it's preferable to start with nodal dissection, as it is more difficult after left upper lobectomy. Vision is compromised by the vascular stumps, and direct retraction over the pulmonary artery is somewhat risky. It's recommended to use the intact lung to indirectly retract the pulmonary artery down and forward to open up the subaortic space. After harvesting station five and six, 
the ligamentum becomes visible. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is seen to have separated from the main trunk of the vagus over the arch of the aorta. It loops around the ligamentum arteriosum and heads up to the right-hand side towards the tracheoesophageal groove. There's a constant inferior cardiac branch of the vagus nerve that crosses the subaortic space, exactly like the right side arrangement. This could be cut with impunity. There's a constant left branch at the point of reflection supplying the nodes and it should not be mixed with the motor branch. This should be cut to gain access under the arch of the aorta. Only a bipolar device should be used close to the motor branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The paratracheal nodes under the arch are dissected under direct vision with little retraction on the ligamentum and arch and pushing the trachea down with a penal. The surgeon should keep an eye on the large caliber motor branch at all times. Video, please. Show video. Video is not, is not required in most cases. Video it's is running. It improves access to station 4 and nodes. The video is running. It's your connection. Just check your connection. At the reflection point, both the vagus and its recurring branch give multitude of short sensory tweaks to the surrounding structures, such as the pulmonary artery, trachea, esophagus, and nodal tissue. These nerves act like a mesh trapping nodes, like fish trapped in a net. The surgeon must make clear distinction between the large caliber motor branch and the small sensory tweaks. The latter ones could be sacrificed with impunity if a bipolar device is used. For loud nodes and FDG avid nodes on the pet, it's mandatory to cut the ligamentum to improve access. The risk of bleeding from a heavily calcified ligamentum and aorta should be assessed before embarking on stapling. The nodes that are in juxtaposition to the motor recurrent laryngeal nerve are grabbed with the node forceps and teased out slowly without using any form of energy at all. No nerve, and this could not be overemphasized. No nerve should be disconnected unless the surgeon has made sure beyond any doubt that it is not the motor branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The last station to be harvested is 2L. These lie in a paratracheal position above the arch of the aorta up to the thoracic inlet. Roughly two nodes are expected to be found in this location. Initially, the pleura of the aortic arch is opened and the superior intercostal vein is sacrificed just above the trunk of the vagus nerve. Pleural opening is extended up to the highest point between the subclavian artery and the vein. Next, the origin of the subclavian from the arch is followed to the origin of the common carotid artery from the arch of the aorta. Two L nodes are found in a tight diamond shaped space between the subclavian and the carotid arteries. The lower border, superior border of the aortic arch, and upper border, the ferris trib. The space is a continuation of the paratracheal space that contains 5L and 4L nodes. The subclavian artery can be taken as a surrogate landmark to the tracheoesophageal groove 
in which the ascending recurrent laryngeal nerve lies after recurring under the ligamentum arteriosum. Where covered by the aortic arch, the paratracheal space contains four L nodes. And above the arch, it contains two L nodes. However, this is the same space. Arrangement of the origin of the subclavian and left common carotid arteries from the aortic arch might render harvesting this group a bit challenging. However, these large arteries are quite mobile and can safely be retracted to expose the space for nodal harvesting. The main stem trachea is easily recognized between the two arteries. Nodes in this area are easily mixed with 3A nodes, which lie in a prevascular plane between the carotid artery and the sternum, far from a paratracheal position. These can be harvested before embarking on 2L nodes to improve exposure. There are three potential dangers in this small apical diamond-shaped space. The descending vagal trunk, the ascending recurrent laryngeal nerve, and the thoracic duct. Inadvertent disconnection or thermal injury of the descending vagal trunk will cause recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, as the recurrent laryngeal nerve is contained within its sheath like two bananas in one skin. The ascending recurrent laryngeal nerve, on the other hand, is found at a deeper level. Most importantly, the surgeon should be aware of the thoracic duct, which takes a short course behind the middle point of the subclavian artery, heading medially and anteriorly across the space to the back of the subclavian and in nominate vein to join the jugular subclavian venous confluence. This concludes the description of the Southampton technique for mediastinal nodal dissection in lung cancer. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. That was just amazing. <clears throat> you want to stop sharing your uh, screen and then we'll get you back up. Okay. Um, I have to learn how to do this. Stop share. Yeah, yeah, you just have to. That's good. That's good. We're back on. Okay. All right. So, uh, I mean, uh, a point which I want to make to everybody is that uh, the anatomy of the lymph nodes is, is absolutely vital. You need to understand exactly what you're doing and where you're getting to uh, in terms of uh, harvesting these lymph nodes. Mr. Emma, now a couple of questions which we will start off with and then we'll take some audience questions if that's okay. A uh, very complex topic, a really complex topic. Uh, a lot of these youngsters who are on this uh, educational program may never have seen uh, lymph node dissection, what you described. Yes. Most of their bosses would probably go in and just pick one node here and one node there. Now, according to the ASCOG uh, ASCOG Zoo 300 study, uh, Gail Darling, who was the main author, uh, she did a sub-analysis uh, to look at survival benefits of lymph node sampling versus mediastinal lymph node dissection. What you do is called as mediastinal lymph node dissection, systematic mediastinal lymph node dissection. And uh, so what these guys have probably seen is lymph node sampling. So you get into three stations, grab a few lymph nodes here and there and get out. So why do you go and do so much of dissection? That's number one. And number two, uh, aren't you worried about damaging other structures? Now this question is for the youngsters because I'm sure they, they are thinking these questions. Well, my answer, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. My, my answer is uh, simple. Yes, there is no difference. Uh, in terms of five-year survival between systematic nodal dissection, or if you like to call it uh, total adenectomy, uh, versus uh, systematic nodal sampling. I'll take you back one step. 
with the definition of systematic nodal dissection, it means two nodes from three different uh, stations. Yeah. And you always have to take station seven. Seven. And you yeah. always have to have more than six nodes at least. Anything less than six, just discard the case from your database. Okay. And in your database, not more than 95% of your patients must have more than 10 nodes. Mm -hmm. This is the IALC sort of definition of systematic nodal dissection. Whereas the systematic nodal sampling, it means you take samples from three nodal stations. It doesn't matter which ones. So you can, in theory, omit uh, station seven but you will have to make it up to at least six lymph nodes. That is the definition. So in essence, there is a major, major difference in ignoring seven. You can ignore seven and take, for instance, nine, uh, seven, and two and four. That is a systematic nodal sampling. You haven't taken seven. Whereas in systematic nodal dissection, you will have to have uh, that station seven. It's a must. That's one main difference. Now, why do I advocate systematic nodal dissection or even uh, total adenectomy? Uh, my practice is total adenectomy, as you know. If there is a lymph node I see, it will have to come out. It will have to be in a pot. The reason for that is a uh, few things. Number one, there is no harm done by doing the extra job of um, harvesting more nodes. So if, if you look at the morbidity mortality between systematic node dissection and systematic node sampling, there is no morbidity or mortality attributed to the systematic node uh, dissection. Can I just uh, stop you there for one second? Uh, there is evidence to show that risk of injury to recurrent laryngeal nerve and risk of injury to the thoracic duct is higher with uh, systematic nodal dissection as opposed to sampling. So what do you say to that? After reading that report, I went on to India, as you remember, and we together mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. got on to dissect the recurrent laryngeal nerve and we understand now the ins and outs of the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, mm -hmm. to an extent that makes uh, cutting the recurrent laryngeal nerve, physical disconnection is a, a very rare event, very, very rare event. On the left side, it's, it's one in a hundred or even more than that. And on the right side is more than one in 600. Oh. Um, so uh, that's my intake. Uh, if, if I would leave alone this problem of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, mm. I've got different disciplines for it. and. Sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of include it. Uh, the thoracic duct again, you, as you alluded to earlier on, very rightly, you need to know what you are doing. If you dissect behind the esophagus, certainly you'll have thoracic duct uh, problems. Mm -hmm. If you do not know where the accessory thoracic ducts are, or if you cut the accessory the right thoracic duct, then you will have mm -hmm. uh, leak. Mm -hmm. In my series of nearly 600 cases, um, I had uh, not more than two, one on the right, one on the left, the one on the right done by a trainee who went and dissected behind the esophagus. He shouldn't go into that area. And on the left-hand side, we couldn't explain it at all and it stopped spontaneously. So these are very rare. Uh, whether you attribute that to the difference in technique between systematic node dissection and systematic node sampling, for me, it's difficult to, to, to swallow. Um, mm -hmm. The, uh, the other um, reasons why I want to do a more extensive lymph nodal dissection is all the randomized controlled trials, all the studies have shown that the larger the number you take, the better the prognosis. And the reason for that is not because you are taking uh, the disease away, it's just because you understand more about the staging. It's the true staging. So you'll be comparing uh, like to like. And by systematic node dissection, definitely you take more uh, lymph nodes. Uh, the other thing is uh, 
the question of um, skipped phenomenon. We don't understand the skipped phenomenon yet. Um, and just to remind your audience, the skip phenomenon is uh, a fiction of uh, a lymph node that is far down the series of lymph nodes. Say, for instance, uh, if you have uh, an involved, say, N1 uh, hyalur lymph node, and it skips all the mediastinal lymph nodes, and say, for instance, uh, you get a station 1 supraclavicular lymph node positive. It has skipped all the mediastinal lymph nodes and went there. We don't know this phenomenon very well. And the reason for that is uh, one or two things. Either we are not looking hard enough or whatever we are doing to the lymph nodes that we take from the mediastinum, the technique that we are looking for, the micrometastasis is not good enough. Um, and in the future, we might find a good enough uh, way of doing that, say for instance, by uh, um, um, molecular uh, studies and uh, say, um, what is it called? Um, uh, cytoanalysis um, 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 and the flow cytometry, for instance. Um, and I would like to bank all these lymph nodes for future, um, for future studies. So in, in say in five years time, if we go retrospectively, and restudy all the uh, lymph nodes that I have taken, you might find out there is micrometastasis that have been missed. At the moment, we don't know why. So it will add to that sort of you know, understanding of the, the skip phenomenon. Um, and also the, one of the reasons I would like to take everything else is I believe that it will reduce the, uh, the chances of uh, micrometastasis because we know that most of uh, N1 and N2 disease, they will have a local recurrence at some stage. And that local recurrence is certainly due to the, pres the, due to the presence of micrometastasis in the mediastinum. So if you take all these lymph nodes, whether we know or not, we have taken the potential micrometastasis from the mediastinum. Uh, if I analyze all my data, say in 10 years time, and I find that most of my patients in whom I do uh, the uh, extensive lymph node dissection, <coughs> that they do not have local recurrence, then I'll be very happy. But it's something that needs to be studied. I can't, I can't claim it at the moment, but I would, I would like to study um, these patients in a future time and see whether this translates into less local recurrence because you've just taken all the lymph nodes. Yeah. So, so there, there to, are reasons for doing that. So just and to Rami sum Porta has, has, uh, has uh, said that in one of his um, papers, I think. He said that if you can, why not? Why you should leave not a single lymph node behind. If you can take them all, you take them all. Okay. So, so your thought process says that there is no risk of injury uh, if you are experienced. Number two, that your staging is definitely more accurate. It will help you for future analysis and number four for micrometastasis. Correct. So now I'll come back and ask you a question. Do you think that the guys who are doing nodal sampling are not doing an adequate operation? Well, you have to go by the evidence. Random mass control trials tell us that they are doing a good job. Um, okay. I have a, studied something uh, which has given me very, very unexpected results. I have restaged all my systematic nodal dissection patients into lobe specific uh, nodal dissection. In other words, I have excluded <clears throat> all the nodes greater than lobe specific nodal dissection in my patients, okay? Presuming that I have done more than what is needed. And I have looked at all these extra nodes, which I have excluded. And I have studied whether I have changed the staging. In other words, okay. if there has been down staging by excluding these lymph nodes. And guess what? Mm -hmm. Not a single lymph node <clears throat> that has been excluded from the systematic nodal dissection has got micrometastasis in it. Conclusion. That is that is 
interesting your point. The conclusion is very clear, is yeah. that systematic nodal dissection, as the evidence stands at the moment, is exactly the same as lobe-specific uh, nodal dissection. They are both the same. They are both safe to adopt in uh, carving uh, pathways at MBTs. Okay. So I'm going to ask you another question on the basis of what you just said. Breast cancer is treated with uh, node-specific, uh, you know, lobe-specific uh, dissection or zone-specific dissection. Can we do that for lung cancer? Say a tumor is in the right upper lobe. Can we just take out station two, four, and seven and call it a systematic nodal dissection? Do we need to dig into eight and nine? Well, Naruki and his uh, team, they published a, uh, a, a paper in, uh, I can't remember the year, <coughs> whether it was 1997, 98, something like that. And they described this, uh, they actually coined the, uh, the the term lobe specific nodal dissection. So as you said, if you are, for instance, doing a right upper lobectomy, uh, you can take a station two, four, and seven, leave out station eight and nine. This is lobe specific. Oh. And if you are doing a right lower lobe, you take eight, nine, seven and four, and you leave two, you don't take two. And you can imagine on the right hand side, it's difficult to take four and not to take two because you take it all of at yeah, least yeah. the technique, you take it as on mass or on block, uh, one thing. The idea is leave the farthest away lymph nodes when you are doing a lobe specific. For instance, if you are doing a right upper lobe, the farthest away lymph node group will be eight or nine. Leave this, you don't need to take them. If you're doing a lower lobe, the farthest away from it is station two and leave those well alone. On the left hand side, if you're doing a right lower, a left lower lobe, then you will take uh, a seven, eight, nine, and you will take five and six, uh, and you omit four L and two L. Oh. Now you have to understand that historically, very few people take either four L or two so if they tell you yeah. to omit them, you are omitting them anyway. Okay. No one is taking them. Very few yeah. people know how to, to do them. So even at that time, it, it was controversial. But uh, as I said, um, it, it's an eye opener. We need to study a lot into this. We need to go into research into this, okay. uh, into this area. All right. Another uh, very nice question, actually. This comes from the audience. Uh, they are saying, that uh, in oligometastases, so you've got a peripheral tumor, T1, T2 tumor in the right upper lobe. You've got a single uh, metastasis in the brain, but you've got one N2. Yes. Uh, uh, guidelines say you should actually not operate on these people because it's N2 disease uh, with oligometastases. So if we use your philosophy, the, the question is asked to you that if you use your concept of, of uh, doing aggressive uh, surgery, should these people fall into the surgical group? As I said earlier on, you have to carve a pathway for this particular patient <coughs> uh, based on what has been published. And unfortunately, you cannot randomize these patients. So there is no level 1A to start with. It's all level two or probably long series uh, description and so on. So what your... Um, audience is describing is they are actually attributing more importance to the N2 than the metastasis in the brain. Uh -huh. This patient has already got a brain meds, which is worse than the N2. Uh -huh. So whether he has got N2 or he hasn't got N2, for me, it doesn't matter. And the N2 is possibly, it's just like what I have described earlier on. The not understanding this is skip phenomenon. In this particular patient, uh, the N2 has uh, highlighted or, or shown up to tell us that in the, uh, uh, that in the, uh, in, in the chain of, of metastasis, um, this one has shown up. But I am sure if you uh, examine the lymph nodes, the mediastinal lymph nodes of all patients who 
present with brain metastasis. I'm sure you will find micrometastasis in the uh, mediastinum at some stage. Okay. So, so to carve a, a pathway for this particular patient of your audience, I would go by the, uh, you know, what is uh, published in the literature so far and offer this patient a resection, including systematic nodal dissection and follow that by chemotherapy. And but maybe the MD, therapy if there's anything. But the, the MDT will not pass this, uh, will not pass this uh, treatment protocol. Uh, it again, you'll have to defend it. You will have to defend it. And other things actually enter into this. If your patient is say 50 years old or 60 years old, a young person who would say, okay, fine, I understand. Uh, it is outside the guidelines, but I want it. You explain to the patient that yes, this is a slightly outside the guidelines. The guidelines tell me that I shouldn't operate on you because of the presence of your N2 disease but there is a way I can operate on you provided you understand what it means to operate outside the guidelines. I'm going to do this and that, the risk goes so and so. And if he agrees, then he gets his operation and he gets his chemotherapy and he gets his uh, secondary from the brain treated. Okay. Five years survival is about 20%. It's not bad compared to no operation. Okay, my, my next question to you is uh, in terms of literature, uh, do you think uh, we get more nodes with open thoracotomy or do you think we get more nodes with VATS? The, the number should be the same. The, the number should be in the head of the surgeon. The head that if the surgeon knows what he's doing, the number should be the same. There are studies, um, Asamora, um, um, Japanese studies, right, left and center, which have visited this um, randomizing patients to open and uh, VATS. And uh, there is no difference. In other words, VATS is as good as open. It depends on the but, surgeon. But does VATS add value when you're doing mediastinal lymph node dissection or robotics for that matter? Um, in terms of adding value, I, I don't think that there should be an added value. It's, it's, now you, you are speaking about the access which is a thoracotomy versus yeah. minimal yeah. access. And I always say that um, when you are going into a hotel, it doesn't matter whether you enter through the small uh, rotary little door or the big door. What matter okay. is what you are going to do inside the hotel. Okay. So uh, the lymph node dissection should be exactly the same, same standards, whether it's open, whether it's robotic, whether it's bats, it should be the same. Okay. Now, post chemotherapy, you know, guys had new adjuvant chemotherapy, and he's come in for surgery. Uh, is does your lymph node dissection change? Are you worried about the quality of the tissue? Yes and no. Sometimes there is absolutely no change at all, and in others, yes, you do find some <clears throat> notorious, you know, bleeding and uh, uh, fibrosis and what have you that limits your uh, your node dissection. And as a general advice, I would say that if you struggle or if you think you can harm the patient by your nodal dissection, please don't do it, stop. Report it in your operation notes that for safety reasons, you had to curtail it, stop it, or uh, shift to another philosophy such as sampling. You, you do not have to persevere, for instance, post radiotherapy and you're doing an operation and you find a lymph node, which is quite a stuck to the esophagus. Should you cut it out, uh, digging a hole in the esophagus? The answer is no. You either take a small piece thereof or report it as it looks malignant and I'm not taking it out for safety reasons. Safety takes precedence. Uh, in, in lymph node sampling, if you've got a single station N2 disease, but you also have a single station N3 disease, would you still operate or N3 is definitely a no-no? N3 is definitely a no-no. Okay, that's good, that's good. It's systematized disease. It's a systematic disease now. So I think it's futile. Yes, you can operate. Yes, you can take it out. If the patient is 50 years old, then I'll tell him I can operate on you outside the guidelines, but the guidelines is do not operate. 
So N3 usually do not occur. So bilateral N2 is, there is no concept called as bilateral N2. It is N3. Okay. Exactly. If you've got bilateral N2, then it is N3. So don't use the term in the, in the exam. Uh, don't use any discussions uh, and say, use the word bilateral N2. That is not correct. Uh, there is no term called as bilateral N2. Right. It is N3. The moment uh, the tumor is on that side, it's N3. I think uh, there are so many sort of uh, controversial issues. And when they are discussed in the MDT meetings, uh, you find that sometimes you are struggling with your colleagues being pulmonologists or oncologists, but you have to be armed by the literature. You must know the literature very well, and you must know uh, that you can produce evidence for what you say. One of those areas is bilateral uh, shadows. Many is the time we get in our MDT meetings, bilateral shadows, and they say, well, if you take uh, one on the right by a lobectomy, then we can um, uh, zap the other one by saber, or we can give him radiotherapy, or we'll observe it for another two years, or we will do radiofrequency ablation, uh, and so on. And I say simply that all the guidelines, which I have mentioned before in Europe, America, uh, uh, Japan, elsewhere, for bilateral disease, if you don't have the facility to prove that these are two synchronous primaries, then you'll have to presume that this is system systemic disease. In other words, this is disseminated cancer. In bilateral, same histology, lung cancer, surgery has no role. Okay, that's good. Now, one quick question is that you, you have shown NCL in your videos. Uh, what's your experience with the uh, other ones, uh, things like Harmonic or Ligashaw? I mean, we've tried everything, haven't we? <laughs> Between the two of yes, us. Absolutely. Yeah, so what, what they're asking, what is your experience with it? I, I think some surgeons probably use a harmonic or ligature on this forum. That's why they're asking, are they just as good or is I'm, NCL better? I'm going to release a video uh, very soon. Uh, I hope that it will be accepted by CTSnet, uh, yeah. which uh, highlights this <clears throat> and introduces uh, NCL to thoracic surgeons. NCL has got uh, one thing uh, more and above the ligature. The ligature has been in the market for the last 15, 20 years. And it's the gold standard. It's very good, it works. And they've got a new model, which has got uh, two things which you can sort of um, extrude and retract uh, a hook. Um, so in essence, you can use uh, monopolar and bipolar technology uh, at the same time. Uh, Liga Shore have got a very excellent nanotechnology. Things do not stick uh, to the jaws of their, of their uh, uh, device. Um, and I like it, I've tried it. The only thing I get is ligature is it does not articulate. The end scene that we have seen in my videos articulates. And this gives it the edge, no doubt. Now, the harmonic, the harmonic has got this active, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, side of it. There is a metal part of it which is active and it's bare. And if you are not very careful uh, about placing it, you can make and dig big holes in big arteries and veins. And this happened to me once or twice. I made big holes in the nominate veins while doing a thyroid operation. And I've uh, also dug holes in the uh, azygous vein and so on. So you have to be very careful when you are using the uh, the harmonic, but it's it's a good uh, it's a good instrument. There's no doubt about it. Again, it doesn't articulate, and the technology doesn't allow you to create a harmonic that articulates. We'll have to see, but I don't think so far the technology allows it. Okay, the the audience is asking a question about some trial going on in Poland. I think it's not fair to ask a expert. Uh, about a trial that's not yet published because ongoing trials, we don't have data. So we cannot uh, talk about any trials that have not been published as yet. Uh, one question that they're asking is, uh, uh, if you've had uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, in N2 disease, uh, does surgery help in persistent N2? What is the role of surgery? 
if you've still got N2. Um, as I said, the recommendation is you will have to prove that following the chemotherapy that there has been response. So surgery okay. is indicated only if there's downstaging. Sure. So if the chemotherapy does not prove that there has been downstage, you should not offer surgery. And to do that, you will have to restage. You have to repeat the mediastinoscopy or repeat the EBOS. The EBOS people will tell you that they will not repeat an EBOS because it's A, technically difficult, B, uh, there's a lot of you know false negatives in it. The yield is not as good as uh, mediastinoscopy. Mediastinoscopists will tell you that a redo mediastinoscopy uh, following any treatment is hellish, is, is, is a real disaster. Some people do it, but uh, others don't. So after new adjuvant chemotherapy, if your lymph nodes still glow up in the dark uh, after the PET scan, we shouldn't offer, offer the, uh, over the surgery. Okay, good. Uh, this is uh, another question has come from an oncology colleague. Uh, and, and it's quite an interesting question. The IASLC has moved the midline to the left. So does that mean seven is N2 for right and N3 for left? I like this question. It's a very good uh, question, but the, he will remember that I'm sure. The IASLC didn't sort of arbitrarily uh, say that it is to be considered to the left of the uh, border of the trachea. This is only for stations two to four. Two to four, that's correct. So it is actually for two to four. So it's always N2, not N. Correct, correct. So seven is not <laughs> right. anything above the bifurcation, not below the bifurcation. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I think we've had a very good discussion. Uh, it's been very, very interesting to hear your viewpoints. This is not an easy topic, uh, but your clarity of thought is what really matters in all of this. And uh, for, for I, I just want to summarize for the youngsters who are there on this uh, group, if I may. Uh, one thing is that uh, for at least exam going people, please talk about guidelines. Uh, try not to venture outside of guidelines, okay? In the exams, don't get into, into controversies. Uh, don't get into any anything that is not there in the guidelines because A, you may not know the evidence for everything that Mr. Hamer has said, or more importantly, you may not remember the evidence in the exam. So my, my understanding, uh, my, uh, my advice to you is in the exam, please stick to guidelines and stay safe. Okay, within the guidelines. However, if you're doing really well and you're in the eight and nine uh, era, which means you're really in the excellent group, then you can start talking about things like these. Uh, you should not say that Mr. Amer said in his lecture that, you know, I will operate on an N2 uh, in the presence of right upper lobe tumor. Uh, don't do that. Just stick to guidelines. Mr. Amer's talk today is very advanced and it is for people like us who every day have got clinical cases and we sit in the MDT and we discuss these cases. And this, in that scenario, you can use Mr. Amer's presentation and the papers he has put up. But in the exam, don't take the risk because the problem is your examiner may not be as well-read as Mr. Amer. That, that, that is, and that's a real uh, possibility. So don't take a chance. All you want to do is pass the exam and get onto the other side. And then when you become a big boss, you can sit in the MDT and question everybody and have this discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Emma. We do appreciate that it is Ramadan and you're fasting and I'm fasting. And we have been going on for two hours. So uh, on behalf of all the audience, I really wish to thank you and, and Ramadan Kareem to you. And I hope uh, uh, the audience will actually go back and listen to this lecture again and again. I don't think this topic can be understood in one listening. You need to go back to the video and see his evidence. And, and it's the three scenarios which he has put in the N2. That's why this lecture was called as N2 controversies. So it is not straightforward. And uh, I promise you in the European board exam, this discussion happens, but not in, the, not in your routine MCH or DNB. Uh, in FRCS, as I said, if you're doing very well, then this will happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Emer, and uh, really, really great, grateful for the time that you've spent with us.
Uh, and I'm going to sign out from the meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks, thanks for having me. And please all stay indoors. Yes, sir. Stay safe. Absolutely. Please. Yes. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.